And over the past few weeks, we have talked about the presence of God, what it is. We talked about why we need the presence of God. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how to get in to the presence of God. You ready for it? The word presence described uh, in the dictionary is the fact or condition of being present, being in attendance, a person or thing that exists or is present in a place but is not seen. So we bought an old house when we moved uh, here to Lima and there is a presence in that old historical home for sure. I'm not talking about ghosts or anything like that. I'm talking about the presence of these really old, nasty floors that need replaced desperately. So when we moved into our house, uh, we realized that we were going to have to do something about it pretty quick. And of course, to do what you do. We called. Uh, we got an estimate to see how much it would cost us. And we, we figured out real quick we were going to have to wait a little bit. We we're going to have to save some pennies and nickels and dollars and wait to have it done. So, so a year passed. And last year, we thought, okay, we've saved quite a bit of money and let's see if we're able to do it now and they came back out checked checked to see where we were at and we couldn't do it again and we had to save a little bit more and finally you guys finally this week this week we met with a guy and, and we're going to be able to do our floors and it's so exciting we're super super happy but he had some news for us when he came he had some news for us and he said this here's the deal guys the cost of wood, yeah, everybody's shaking their head. The cost of wood is up and the prices are high. And I thought of this little economic principle called supply and demand. <laughs> but, but our guy, he has a guy. Yeah, you have a guy? All right, everybody right now, just start laughing. Just stop. Give me your biggest, finest belly laugh. Ha, ha, ha. Come on. Come on, dude. Ha, ha, Okay. Work with me today. You guys are a tough crowd. But our guy, he has a guy. Everybody needs a guy. My dad was a car dealer, and we had a guy for just about everything. He was a guy. He had a connection. He had a source. He had a supplier that, in fact, could supply the materials that I need to get my floors done if I was willing to pay a price, that high price, if I'm willing to pay for it. Sadly, the supplier just didn't want to drop off 1,400 square feet of material off at my house so that I could get my floors done. As a matter of fact, I have to pay and I have to play a part in the whole process. So in economics, supply and demand is defined like this. Supply describes the total amount of a specific good or services that is available to consumers. Yep. And demand refers to a consumer's desire to purchase those goods and services and willingness to pay a price for those specific things. Supply and demand. Here's the good news. In Philippians 4, 9, the Bible says, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So everything you need is in Christ Jesus and miracles happen when we get into his presence because his supply his supply is limitless. There's no limit to God. There's no limit to his wisdom, no limit to his power or his mercy or his grace or his love. Our God is limitless. Now, the word demand, that's a little bit of a, um, I don't know, a strong word. What, do, do you agree with me? A strong word, the word demand, but here's what it means. The word demand means a seeking to be sought after something you seek or to earnestly desire the word demand. And I would like to submit to you today that if his presence is in fact our purpose, then we must seek his presence. And for the sake of this message, if you will, we might even say we must demand something from his presence. All right? Now understand, I'm not being rude or, or arrogant with God. I want you to understand that word demand means to seek after supply, but we're going to use it a lot in this message. So supply and demand, the presence of God must be sought after. Why? Because it's in the presence 
of God that we find the supply of the Spirit. Philippians 1.19, look at it with me. For I know that this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So in other words, when we pray, there is a supply of the Spirit in his presence, a limitless supply for healing, for salvation, for deliverance, for freedom, for provision. There's a supply of hope for homes that are in crisis. There's a supply of joy for your depression or your anxiety. There's a supply of miracles for your marriages. There is a supply of the spirit of Jesus that is limitless and it will not run out. And here's the good news, folks. It's for all of us. It's for all believers. If Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, you have a reservoir. You have a supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But, everyone say but. But But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. We're in Ephesians 4 here. Verse 12 says, for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the supply of the spirit is for everyone, for all of us. However, in Ephesians, in Corinthians, there's a list of some jobs, let's call them jobs, or roles, or gifts that Christ gave the church. He supplied the church with these gifts for the sake of the church for the perfecting of the saints, to build up, to strengthen the body of Christ, which is the church, supply and demand. Let's look at an example in scripture, all right? Turn to James 5, verses 14 and 15. Here's what it says. Watch this with me. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. When we look at that scripture, did you see what it said? It said that the sick person, the one who is sick makes the call. The sick person understands that the supply of the spirit for healing is found, according to James, the book of James, we just read it, it is found in the faith-filled, anointed prayers of the elders who call upon the name of the Lord. A demand is placed. A demand is placed on the reservoir or the supply of the spirit And it results in a miracle. It results in healing. It results in salvation. That's what James just said. A demand on the spirit. Understand this. It's not about who does it. It's not about uh, the, the person, but it's all about the spirit's supply. The elders, those praying, they're just the vessels. They're just the conduit of, of what the, who the Lord uses to work through. I want you to understand that you are seeking his presence. You're putting a demand on the presence of God when you respond to what you hear. Your response puts a demand on the presence. When you respond to what is being preached, (laughs) when you respond to the songs that are being sung, you put a demand on the presence of God. You're seeking after it. You're participating in it. When I was a kid, uh, my, my grandparents had two extra refrigerators in the garage. Who has an extra fridge in the garage? Yeah, yeah. So at Grandma and Grandma's house, one of the refrigerators was used for like extra groceries. But the second refrigerator was full of pop. 
bottles of pop. Uh, how many say, yes, I remember glass bottles. Mm-hmm. Grandma had every kind you can imagine in this refrigerator. But here's the deal. Um, the refrigerator itself had a short in it. And my cousins, we, we all would get together. We thought it was really fun. Not sure why, but we thought it was a lot of fun to grab a hold of the refrigerator and to grab a hold of something metal until we'd get a, you know, and we would get a shock from the refrigerator. How many of you ever do anything? Come on, are we not the only one? That's why my hair is curly. That's right. We, we would actually take turns doing this. I don't know. We were crazy. We would take turns doing this. I think it was more fun to watch my cousins get shocked than it was to actually get shocked. I would get a little nervous about it. But here's the deal. The short was in the fridge, but we drew the shock by touching it. We drew out the shock by positioning ourselves on the fridge and on the metal. We drew out the shock. Luke 6 talks about a huge crowd who showed up to hear Jesus and to be healed of all their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power Listen, power was coming out from him and healing them all. Did you see that? Did you see what that scripture said? Jesus, he's the supply of the spirit, the reservoir of healing. He's the source. He was there in Luke chapter six and power, the Bible says, went out from him to all those who tried to touch him. All those who tried to touch him, the Bible says they were healed. (laughs) All, all of them were healed. But the power went out from the source because the people drew it out. They sought after God. They demanded something from his presence, if you will. You can draw out the presence of God. Did you know that? You can draw the presence of God by the way you worship by the attitude you have when the word is being preached. You can draw out the presence of God by the way that you respond to the altar. You know, there's something really powerful about movement. There's something powerful about movement. Pastor says it like this, your response is your responsibility. I can say that a hundred times in this message. But on that day in Luke chapter six, Jesus was teaching, okay? He was teaching, preaching, if you will. And several times throughout scripture, healing is accompanied with teaching. We get that confused sometimes, but Jesus was teaching and then healing took place. This huge, large crowd, they showed up to hear what Jesus had to say and they were healed. Can you imagine that? Can you just imagine getting to sit under the teaching of Jesus Christ? I have a feeling I would hope that I would come with a little bit of expectation if I was getting to hear the supplier, the reservoir, share some things. I I wonder, I don't think he did, but I wonder if Jesus had a pulpit. You know, the Bible says he would stand in front of the crowds, kind of like church maybe, I don't know. I don't know, I don't... He didn't need any notes. No, he didn't. We need this pulpit. You know, pulpits have transformed over the years, right? You know, used to, that big sacred desk, my pastor, oh, it was huge. He had a microphone attached to it that came up. I mean, we played hide and seek. We actually hid in the pulpit because it was so big, you know, and now we've transformed to this little, I guess it doesn't matter. It it, it doesn't matter, no. Uh, But we've transformed the pulpit. The word pulpit or or an actual pulpit um, we hear about in the book of Nehemiah. Way back in the Old Testament, it says that a large wooden platform was built for the prophet Ezra because he had a word to speak to the people. And Ezra stood in the pulpit and he read the word. The Bible says he read from early morning. So let's just say five or 6 a.m. That's early morning. He read the word until noon. 
So about six hours, six or seven hours, the pastor preached. You guys a little nervous? You're hungry, aren't you? It's, it's just 1127, but for six or seven hours, Ezra preached the word. And do you know what the Bible says the people did? They did. Oh, you robbed my, you took my, that's okay. That's okay. That's all right. That's it. They did. They stood. They stood. <laughs> they stood. They didn't, they didn't get on their phone and start flipping on Facebook. They didn't go ahead and put their DoorDash order in so that it would be, you know, at home by the time they got back from church. You know, they didn't, they, they didn't get up and go to the bathroom five or six or seven times during service. No, John, they stood. They stood for six or seven hours while the prophet read the word. And you know what else they did? The Bible says while Ezra preached, it says that the people shouted. They were excited about the word of God that was coming forth. They got to hear it. They got to listen to it. And they responded to it, not only by standing, but by shouting. And to boot, when it came time to worship, the Bible says in Nehemiah that they bowed with their faces to the ground and they worshiped the Lord. I heard a pastor once say that there is power up in here when the word of God is being preached to pull people out of the pit. That's what the job of the pulpit is, is to pull people out of the pit, the pit of depression, the pit of despair, the pit of fear or disease, the pit of addiction or alcohol. When the word comes forth, there is a pulling out of the pit. And I think that somebody today needs to be pulled out of the pit. You didn't come here just for fun. You didn't come here just for kicks. You came because God has a plan and a purpose for you to be here, and I can't help but wonder if part of it is to be pulled out from your pit. So many times, though, we wait, we sit back, and we wait on God to do something, but really, sometimes God's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to do something. You see, that's what praise and worship is all about. So remember those apostles and preachers and teachers and, you know, those giftings we talk. Well, we have some worship leaders in our house. We have some worship leaders who understand the gifts and the callings on their lives. And so their job, what they do is they, they stir the atmosphere and they might say something to you like, would you raise your hands with us? Would you clap? Would you respond? Would you sing a new song unto the Lord? They're not just doing that for fun. They're not just doing it because they saw that's what Bethel did or that's what Elevation Worship did. They're doing it because they know when the people respond in worship, something happens in the atmosphere. It stirs it up. So, so moving forward, if the song says clap, what would you do? And if the song says shout, what would you do? And if the song says dance, <laughs> I can't wait to see that. I just think that's so much fun. We do this little, mm, mm, you know, little Christian dance. Pastor just jumps up and down. It's great. It's great. I can't do that. I can't be jumping up and down. And when the song says, raise your hands, this is the easy one. We simply raise our hands because our response, our participation actually stirs up the presence of God. And the Bible tells us that praise makes Satan flee. Psalms 18.3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. If you were in church in the 80s, you might have sang it like this. I will call upon the, I will, oh yeah. Who is worthy to be you got it. We used to do that little echo thing back in the day. It was all kinds of, all kinds of good stuff. But when we praise, an atmosphere is created when we praise, an atmosphere is created for the Holy Spirit to work and move and for God to answer our praise. He answers our prayers through our praise. So our praise then is a demand on the supply of the Spirit. We're seeking after 
We're earnestly desiring God to move. Psalm 8, 2 says, through the praise of children and infants, through the praise of children. How many kids do we have in this place? Raise your hand, wave at me. Listen, I want to tell you something. Whether you're a little one or you're a big one or you're sitting next to your parent, if your parent, how many of your parents said you're going to church today whether you like it or not? Anybody? Yep. Uh, Whether you like it or not. I love it. Let me tell you something, parents. You're a good parent when you make your kids do that. And kids, if you are here with your parent who made you come to church today, you ought to turn to them and say, thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. Because your parents love you so much. They have an understanding that it is more about this world that we live in, but there's an eternity at stake. And when you, as a student, as a young person, get into the presence of God and learn how to praise, the Bible says a, a established is a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe of the Avengers. So there's something even now being put into you young people. It's being established so that when you come against a foe or an avenger, you have a stronghold to stand with you. And it's the presence of God. God inhabits the praises of his people. You might come to church tired and and wonder why you just can't seem to get what everybody else is getting. Have you ever been there? You're like, you see people raising their hands and clapping and you just don't understand. Or maybe it's been a long time since you yourself have had a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. I challenge you today to put a demand on the supply of his presence because you don't have to sit through another service and leave here dry as a bone. You don't have to. James 4, 8 says very clearly, draw near to God. You draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I like to think of it this way. The greater the demand, the greater the supply. Now watch this with me. Church can go to a whole nother level when people come in with great expectation. Expectation is the breeding ground for manifestation. And, and, and so as the pastor preaches, and we expect God is going to move through his word. Remember, Jesus was teaching and preaching and a bunch of people got healed. If we come expecting that, you know, some of you get it. Some of you get it. John gets it. Brian gets it. Some of you guys who clap and you shout amen, you understand um, that something happens when we kind of support the pastor a little bit. They get behind him a little bit. Last week when I was preaching, it got to this point where the scripture was coming forth and, and I was starting to feel an unction of the Holy Spirit and I looked back, I don't see him today, but I looked back and Johnny Banks in the back row, a man who had just lost lost his father, a grieving man. But he came to church that day and he made a demand on the supply of the spirit. And when the word came forth, that man stood up. He started clapping. He started shouting. And I'm going to tell you something. People around him started doing the same thing. And there was a shift in the atmosphere. I can testify today that people's lives were changed because of the word that came forth. The word that came forth. I I haven't felt an unction of the spirit like that. Those are just kind of old Pentecostal terms for, I don't know, I felt the Holy Spirit on me. I haven't felt him that way in in quite a while, so much so that when I went to walk down the steps after second service, I get, my knees were knocking. I was shaking. I was responding to the presence of, of God, listen, don't, don't sit there and think it's about the preacher. We're not talking about pumping up the preacher. We're talking about that our response pumps up the presence of God. And if anything makes you shout or dance or clap, it should be the presence of God. There were two blind men. The Bible talks about two blind men. They were sitting by the road and Jesus was passing by and they started shouting at him. They started shouting for him. And the crowd didn't like it. They, and I don't know why they didn't like it, but they started, shh, stop that. 
Don't do that. Shh. But these two men, these two blind men, they didn't hush it up. The Bible says that they cried out all the louder. They, they started hollering so that somebody, somebody could hear them. And in Matthew 20, the Bible says that Jesus stopped. He was walking along. He was with a crowd of people. And because these two blind men started shouting for him, he stopped in his tracks and he said to them, what do you want from me? Hey man, what do you want from me? And you know what they said? They said, master, we want our eyes to be opened. <laughs> we want to see. And the Bible says, deeply moved, Jesus touched their eyes and they had their sight back that very instant. And they joined in the procession. Jesus didn't get mad at them for interrupting his mid-afternoon walk. He didn't turn his nose down at them because they were hollering at the top of their lungs. No, the Bible says he was deeply moved by their shouts, by their desire, by their earnest seeking after him. He was deeply moved. And God is moved, LFC. He is moved, online church, when we respond to his presence. He is moved by our cries. He's moved by our worship. He's moved by our praise. He's moved by our hand clapping. He is moved by our response because here's the deal. We don't just need Jesus to pass us by. We don't want him to pass us on by. We want him to stop and move in our midst. And we do want his miracles to come forth. That's what it means when we say his presence is our purpose. These two men, they weren't going to let the crowd hush them. They would just crowd louder and louder. And my favorite part of that is it says they joined the processional. You know, they had a victory march. They started leaping and dancing and rejoicing and shouting. And they weren't even in the church. They joined in. You see, the presence of God isn't just about what happens here. It affects what happens there. The presence of God is not just for the saints but for us to take that presence to the sinners, not just for the righteous, but for the religious. The presence of God changes and transforms you. And when it does, I sure hope that you will join in the parade, that you'll join in the procession. Now there's a flip side. How many of you know there's always a flip side? And in Mark chapter six, we find Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth. Just the chapter before, Jesus was healing the sick. He was casting out demons. He was even, I don't know, raising the dead. He was doing some pretty powerful things. But in Nazareth, verse five says, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Why? Why? Don't tell me it's just up to Jesus to do everything. We can't sit here and expect that it's all up to him because if he just did it to do it, then he would have done it in his hometown. That was his hometown, the ultimate connection. Listen, he was the hometown hero. He, he knew their names. He went to kindergarten with some of them. He knew what their mom served for after school snack. You know, he knew what kind of uh, flowers was always in the flower box come springtime. He was a hometown Hero, but I believe that the reason Jesus, one of the reasons, didn't do many miracles was because they chose to ignore his presence. They chose to ignore his presence, and the Bible says, listen to this, this is Jesus. The Bible says he was astounded by their stubbornness. Jesus. 
his mind. He couldn't wrap his mind around why. He was astounded by their stubbornness. You know what the Bible has to say about being stubborn or stubbornness? It says this, God will give you over to it. He'll give you over to your stubbornness, to your own devices. Your stubbornness will cause you to be far from his righteousness. Your stubbornness will cause you to go backward and not forward. Hosea, where are my Hosea girls? We did Hosea in a small group first semester. And you know what we learned there that Hosea compared, compared the people to a stubborn heifer. You calling me fat? <laughs> no. <laughs> that was funny. All right, a stubborn heifer. <laughs> a cow. A cow that cannot be pastured. That's what Hosea says. A stubborn heifer who cannot be pastured. What happens when the cows are taken to pasture? They eat. They graze out there. They graze on the pasture. Interestingly enough, I won't go into too much detail, but there's a difference between going to the pasture and to the meadow. There are some things that are significant about, about the uh, nutrients that are provided in one place and the other. But Hosea says like a stubborn heifer who cannot be pastured, when you're stubborn, you're not gonna be able to be fed. And it doesn't matter how good the soil is. It doesn't matter if the temperature is just right or there's enough rainfall. No matter how perfect the atmosphere is, you cannot be fed if you are stubborn. Or if you're passive. If you're stubborn or if you're passive, it will cause you to not be able to be fed. So your hunger your thirst, your desire, your attitude, your humility, your spirit, your seeking, your expectation, your demand on the supply of the spirit matters. And not only matters here within the church, but it matters out there. Come on, somebody know who I'm, what I'm talking about. It matters that the presence of God is in here, but it matters all the more that the presence is out there as well. And so when we look at that, how do we get into the presence of the, of the Lord? Or how do we get in the presence of God outside the church? We need to look at the book of Acts. So grab your copy of God's word and turn to Acts chapter 16. And you're gonna find in verse 16, we're gonna find uh, that this is, Paul's second missionary journey. They're doing incredible work for God. People are getting saved by the droves. Signs and wonders are happening right before their very eyes. And the Bible says this, that as they were going down, uh, down to the place of prayer, they were going down to seek the Lord. It says that they met a demon-possessed slave girl. And the Bible describes her that she was not only just demon possessed, but the devil himself gave her the power to be a fortune teller. Now let's stop right there. I'm telling you right now, sons and daughters of God, if you're looking for answers, you're looking just to have a good time or whatever, and you make your way into a fortune teller, well, there's several across the city you go and you get tarot cards read. You go and get your palm read. You go and you follow the horoscope or you have someone give you a word uh, of, the, of the future and what's going to happen. Listen, you're participating with doctrines of demons. And you need to repent. Listen, you need to repent of that and ask God's forgiveness and don't ever go back to that ever again. Because you are calling, you are putting a demand on a supply that does not come from God. And I will tell you this, when that supply comes upon you, it don't want to let go of you. 
Come on, someone talk to me here today. So here she was, a demon-possessed girl, and she had the gift of giving fortunes. Well, her owners, her slave owners, they were making mountains of money off of this girl because the devil was giving her this gift of fortune-telling. Well, she happened to come across Paul and Silas one day, and she began to cry out, these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Over and over and over again. And Paul... He's walking along, I want to meet this dude, because I feel like he, he would just like, he wants to give you Jesus, but he wants to punch you in the mouth at the same time. That's my kind of guy right there. And so here he was, he's, he's preaching the good news, but yet you have this little girl, these men are from the most high, and they're going to tell you how to be saved. Listen, God doesn't need the enemy's publicity. God doesn't need the devil to come up and say, no, these are the the anointings at Lima first. You need to go there. And Paul was so aggravated. He was so annoyed. He had enough of that nonsense. And what did he do? He turned around and looked at that little thing. And he said, he cast that demon out of that little girl. Now, most people... With common sense, they would be rejoicing because this little girl has been set free from demonic activity. Come on, someone talk to me today. They would be excited, but the city got into an uproar. Her the slave masters were in an uproar. Why? Not that, not, not that, you, that, that they did something to this little girl. They were mad because they weren't going to make any more money. You see... It's all fun and games till you affect economics. So guess what happened? Got mad, and in Acts chapter 16, verse 23, here were Paul and Silas doing the work of the Most High. They were doing the work of the Lord. They were doing the work of the evangelists and prophets and apostles. They were doing God's work. But now, the Bible says they were severely beaten. And they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape. Why did he do that? Because the apostles had a way of escaping from prison because God would come in and lead them out. God did something supernatural in those prisons. So he said, you make sure that they don't get out of this place. So what did he, So the jailer put them in the inner dungeon and he clamped their feet and put them in stocks. Can you even fathom that? You're doing God's work. You're preaching the good news. People are getting saved, delivered, and healed. And it makes someone mad and you find yourself in prison. Mark my words. It's coming again. It's coming again. Christianity is being censored right now. There are things that are happening all over the world right now, but because they don't want you to know, there's Christians that are being martyred all across the world right now, but you don't hear about it because they censor it. Guys, they're coming for the church. But I will tell you, as dark as it's going to get, that's where the brighter the light is going to shine. We don't have to fear man. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you don't need to fear man. So listen, look at this. Acts chapter 16, they're in the dungeon. It's dark, it's stinky. Sounds of death and moaning and groaning were all over the place. And it says this, around midnight. We always had this saying, nothing good ever happens after midnight. You need to be in bed, sleeping, snoozing with your little mask on, you know, cucumbers on your face. You need to, 
right? Snoring, there, nothing ever good. How many can testify to that? Can I get a witness? Nothing ever, and there's nothing good on TV either. So just don't, turn it all off and go to sleep. But around midnight, Paul and Silas, they were doing something. They were praying and singing hymns to God and all the other prisoners, what are they doing? They're listening. They're listening. It's like, it's like the, the very first radio that's going on. They had a little concert right there in the middle of it. What were they doing? They were praying. Well, when we pray, what is praying? Matthew talks about it, Matthew 6, that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things will be added. We go after God, we, 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 we pray, we call upon the name of the Lord. James chapter five, verse 16b, it says this, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Jesus said this in Matthew, Matthew chapter six, but when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, he's going to reward you. But the key is the, that one of the first two words, when you pray. But if we're not careful, we're going to fall into this religious Christianity that says, all I got to do is go to church. No, we are to seek first. We are to pray. Jesus said it. But when you pray, it's not an option. Friends, we've got to call upon the name of the Lord most high. We've got to call upon him and make our petitions known to him. Why would God answer if we don't ask? But what are they doing? They're praying. And what else were they doing? They were singing. They were singing. Colossians chapter 3, 16 and 17 says this. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish, admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs in the spirit. Singing to God with grateful hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Singing, worshiping, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Getting in your car, it doesn't matter if you sound good or not. Make a joyful noise into the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Psalm 100, verse one through five. Shout to joy for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. He made us. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And then it says this, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Name. They were they were praying. If you were in a dungeon, shackled for doing it, you'd be praying. Maybe. We may be singing. But in Acts chapter 16, verse 26, it says something very interesting. It says, suddenly. Do you know what a suddenly is? Suddenly is uh, it, it, unaware. You could say it like this, man, I didn't see that coming. Suddenly, unexpectedly, it says this, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Can you begin to see it? You're doing great things for God, but the next thing you know, you found yourself in a place that you never thought you would be. It's dark. It stinks. More than likely, after they have beaten you, they've stripped you down naked and you're freezing to death. But in the midst of that dungeon... All of a sudden, out of the depths of your heart, you began to say, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power 
and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place and I exalt thee can you sing it if you know it I exalt thee come on from the front to the back sing I oh I love it oh in the middle of the darkness, sing, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, I exalt thee, with sounds of death and despair. If we were in the same situation, I dare say that most of us might be extremely angry, we might be bitter, we might be broken. And the last thing on our mind might be God. We might be shouting for justice, we might be calling for our attorney, we might be, be, be shouting out on social media, we might be calling our neighbors and telling them because of our outrage. But Paul and Silas, what were they doing? They were praying, they weren't complaining. They were praising, they weren't griping, they were grateful, they weren't hateful. Their physical conditions weren't comfortable. They were broken, abandoned, and they were vulnerable. Yet they chose to lift up the name of the Most High. You see, the presence of God is not limited to an ideal location or time that has climate control. Today, you may be here. You may be here desperate, hurts, frustrated, disillusioned. Oh, listen, God knows all about that. God knows all about it. He knows exactly where you are. He knows your exact state of mind and what's going on in your heart. Yet he will make his way through the corridors of your prison and find his way right into your cell with the keys to unlock your chains to set you free this very day. Church, if only you will lift up your voice and cry out to God, it's then that there's going to be a shaking in the house. There's going to be a quaking in the house. That's not only going to unlock you from the false claims of the enemy, but those around you can be set free today as well. All it's going to take is a willing heart. All it's going to take is a willing heart pushing through the pain, pushing through the emotions, pushing through if you will begin to open up your mouth and exalt the mighty name of Jesus.